So, as part of a major initiative to highlight tourists and other facilities in Roscommon, a former minister in Galway West TD, Eamon O'Queeve, is to give a special talk on the life and times of the legendary Roscommon-born priest, Father Michael O'Flanagan. This St. Patrick's Day, uh, it will be hosted through the Suck Valley Way Facebook page and it will be of interest to people here and at home, especially in the US, for her father of Flanagan made such an impact over the time of his life. And he was by any means no ordinary man. And let's uh, find out a little bit more about him and his uh, close connections to those involved in the uh, struggle for independence at that time. May Moran joins us uh, on the Let's Talk this afternoon up in North County Roscommon. They may. Thanks for taking our call. You're welcome, Mary Claire. Now, for many people, they would be familiar with Father O'Flanagan's work, but for you, he was um, he, he's left a lasting legacy. A Roman Catholic priest, an Irish language scholar, but friendly with many of the leaders of the revolution. Yes, he was. He, uh, he was a very talented man. Uh, as you say, he was highly intelligent, a scientist, a fluent Irish speaker, and a great orator. And above all, he was a great advocate for the people that he served. Um, he was here in Krasna in, at a critical period between 1915 and 1918. Uh, and indeed, I came across him as a young person because uh, there's a plaque in Krasna Church which was put there when I was a teenager. So I'd always heard about him. But he, he, he was above all... Uh, uh, he'd be fully behind what the Suck Valley Way initiative is trying to do because he always urged his parishioners uh, to use whatever resources were available locally so that they could provide for themselves and their families. And, you know, this is exactly what the Suck Valley Committee are doing, um, you know, trying to highlight the rich heritage of County Roscommon and to develop communities around the Suck Valley to attract tourists and locals alike. And as you say, Mary Claire, he was in America, he was a very influential figure in the the 1900s, really, between 1900 and 1922. Uh, Not only was he involved in the War of Independence, but he had been in America between, much of the time, between 1904 and 1912. And he brought with him a group of ladies who uh, went there to promote Irish lace. Now, the initial trip to America was to collect funds for the school in Loch Lynn and also to establish a school in Loch Lynn and then to, uh, for a cheese-making industry there. Uh, he later was w- went again to America with the group who promoted Irish lace, which is still very um, sought after in America. Um, and... He was the advocate of the of the Gaelic League, the envoy of the Gaelic League there in 1910. But he returned to Ireland in 1912, and he took up a curious position in Roscommon. Now, he had a great sense of justice. Uh, he, he went to Sligo in 1913 to urge the striking dock workers at Sligo Port to continue to fight for their rights. And then when he went to Tiffany, uh, he he urged the local people to go and put turf on the banks that they had had on the bogs, but were at that stage being denied them because the Congested Districts Board had taken over and were uh, only allowing turf to be cut uh, by their uh, tenants. Uh, so he was always an advocate for the local people. Uh, he came to prominence nationally when he spoke at the O'Donovan Rossa lying in state in, in City Hall in Dublin. O'Donovan Rossa was an old Fenian who had died in America and mm-hmm. he, he was brought back and uh, he was lying in state in um, the City Hall and Father O'Flanagan gave a speech there and from then on he was more or less a national figure and uh, he was a great orator so he used his oratorial skills in particularly in the first uh, national, for the first nationalist candidate, nationalist independent candidate, Tom Plunkett, who was elected in North Roscommon. Uh, and he went on to reorganise Sinn Féin 
and to drive its success at the 1918 general election, which led, of course, to the first stall. Um, he was here and, in Krasnaya from 1915 to 1917. And, of course, that was the time of the 1916 Rising. And my uncle, Paddy Morton, was uh, an Irish volunteer who, at that stage, was an adjutant in D Company, Dublin 2 Brigade in Dublin. But, of course, he was often a visitor to Krasna. And he and Father O'Flanagan liaised together to bring guns down to Krasna for the... uh, volunteers in Krasna for, for the 1916 Rising. He brought a trunk containing 16 guns, one of which we still have here in this house, um, to Krasna in preparation for the 1916 Rising. He got off the train in Carrick and Shannon with his trunk because Boyle was a garrison town, so it was easy. Mm-hmm. It would be more likely to be, to be, he'd be more likely to be held up in Boyle. Um, and uh, and I'd say, I mean, phenomenal that, um, uh, and, and we know that this is, isn't un, uncommon, but that um, as well as maybe supporting through his oration and, and, and I suppose people's desire for freedom, he was actually going as far as supporting the the armed struggle. And I know this was later referenced in his appointment with uh, Sinn Féin, but Take us through, I suppose, the the intertwining history of what happened with those guns and the local people in the area at the time. Well, actually, nothing happened because of the countermanding order that was issued by Owen McNeil. Uh, what my father said in his statement, he would have been one of the Krasna volunteers, and what he said in his statement uh, uh, to the pensions board was that they were standing to awaiting orders. So no orders came for them to uh, to be active in the 1916 Rising, unlike my uncle, who was actually involved in uh, the 1916 Rising in Dublin. He was involved in Jacob's factory and was, after the surrender, he was deported to Nuxford in Manchester and finished up in Frongup in Wales before returning home uh, after his appearance at the Shanky Commission, he returned home in August of 1916. Uh, so nothing really happened in Krasna uh, during the 1916 Rising. So the, guns, but, the guns were rendered useless. <laughs> At that stage, uh, but when yeah. we move forward then to, uh, as you said, your brother, P- Uncle Paddy was quite friendly with Father O'Flanagan, your father um, involved as well. This is a very poignant time. Uh, we were remembering Selton Hinn last week, but you too have been remembering your family connections at this time as well, May. We have, yes, because yesterday was the 100th anniversary of my uncle Paddy's execution, along with five others in Mountjoy Jail, or six people executed on the 14th of March in 1921. And my uncle was one of those. Now, he and Tommy Whelan were executed for their alleged part in the assassinations of the intelligence officers on Bloody Sunday, November the 20th, 1920, November the 21st, 1920. Um, he, uh, he was at, a, at his court martial. He was found guilty of uh, the assassination of Ames and Bennett in Mount Street. Now, he wasn't in Mount Street, and he had an al- alibi witnesses who gave him an alibi to say that he had been at Mass in Black Rock, that he had taken the first tram to town, that he had gone to attend his union meeting because he was. Very, uh, he was the president, the national president of the Barman's Union at the time, mm-hmm. and that he had gone there and uh, that he couldn't have been anywhere near Mount Street. Uh, I subsequently discovered during my research for my book which, about my uncle that he was, in fact, in charge of the party who went to the Gresham Hotel. Uh, where they provided cover for the active services union men who shot two uh, agents, well, two supposed to be agents there, uh, Captain McCormack and Lieutenant Wilde. Captain McCormack had Roscommon connections. He was married 
to one of the O'Connors who at that time owned the Abbey Hotel in Roscommon. And your uncle became one of the Forgotten Ten. Um, but which unfortunately we haven't been able to remember on a on a large scale level this year. No, we haven't. Uh, they were uh, uh, exhumed from their graves in Mount Joy, where they had lain for eighty years, and they were reburied at the full state funeral in Glasnevin Cemetery in two thousand and one. Now we haven't been able to uh, remember them this year, but fortunately in twenty sixteen we had erected memorial stones to different people in this area under the Arcarden Remembers um, Committee. And we had remembered all those who lost their lives uh, in that period, those who lost their lives in World War I from the parish, and there were 11, I think, who lost their lives from this small parish at that time. Uh, the RIC men who lost their lives and all those who lost their lives in the War of Independence, including the civilian Joe Malloy, who was shot while out uh, spreading manure on his father's farm. And we have that anniversary coming up just in, on the 26th of March. He was only 15 years old, completely innocent. He wasn't part of uh, the uh, volunteers or the IRA at the time. He was just doing his, the work on the farm and uh, when the military were combing the area for suspects from the Kiju ambush, which had, which had happened on the 22nd mm -hmm. of uh, March, they came across the lads working in the field and just shot him uh, because they said that they had seen people shooting from the hedges. There were no people in the hedges. He, it was just a, 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 a tragic shooting. May, thanks for your time and for joining us on the programme this afternoon. May Moran there joining us on Let's Talk.